that's well. My internet um, is unstable. Okay. Well, hopefully it will stabilize the course of our conversation. Um, again, welcome everyone. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you to the seventh edition of the Joy Trip Reading Project book discussion. Um, I'm your host, James Edward Mills, and today I'm pleased to introduce to you my good friend and colleague, the author of the book, Planet Walker. But before we dive into our evening conversation, I want to make sure that we acknowledge uh, that I'm screening into you tonight um, from Madison, Wisconsin, which is the ancestral homeland of the Ho-Chunk people, a place known for time and memorial as Day Joe. Please, wherever you are in North or South America, take the, a moment to recognize and acknowledge the Native people who once called wherever you now live home. Uh, I'd also like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome the, uh, to thank the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies um, here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for their support um, and for this and other online discussions, as well as the financial support of Saris Innovations, Outdoor Research, um, and National Geographic. Um, who provide the funds to pay our speakers each month a small stipend. Uh, again, as I always like to say, uh, friends don't let friends work for free. Now, uh, for those of you who do not know who I am, um, I'm uh, James Edward Mills, and I'm a freelance journalist and independent media uh, producer. And I have a specialty in outdoor recreation and environmental conservation with a further specialty in issues uh, concerning racial diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also the access to our natural resources and our public land. And I teach an undergraduate course here at the Nelson Institute called Outdoors for All. And uh, many of the titles that we're discussing in this book group are on my reading list. And um, this month's discussion is another opportunity for non-students and the general public to learn a little about the experiences of people of color and our relationship with the natural world and our shared um, experience through memoir and academic research. Now, our guest tonight is Dr. John Francis. And to give you a little background for those of you who haven't done the reading, and I hope you all did, um, in 1971, um, John witnessed a catastrophic oil spill in San Francisco Bay. And it was this greasy sludge that coated the resident sea life um, and stained nearby beaches um, that left an incredible impression on him as well. Um, as a young man uh, at the dawn of the environmental movement, um, he felt compelled to act. Um, but what can one, what really, what can one person do when, um, when we have a society that seems bent on our own destruction? Um, so John took it upon himself to um, take his devotion um, to a very high level, and he took a vow of silence. For 17 years, he did not utter a word, and um, yet he still managed to earn a college degree and a graduate, um, also a graduate degree in natural resources and environmental studies, actually here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, he also took a vow never to um, ride in an automobile. Um, and for the next 22 years, um, he did not ride in a, um, in a motorized vehicle and literally walked wherever he went. Um, John went to, on to become uh, a, the United Nations Goodwill Ambassadors for the world's grassroots communities. And the US uh, government hired him to help establish uh, the very first policies for the management of oil spills. John is an associate here at the Gaylord Nelson Institute of Environmental Studies. Um, and also um, he is uh, teaching, teaches both graduate and undergraduate seminars in environmental studies. Um, and he's also a fellow of the National Geographic Society where he's published two books, Planet Walker, 17 Years of Silence and 22 Years of Walking and The Ragged Edge of Silence, Finding Peace in a Noisy World. Um, they are partners in developing planetary curriculum, um, as well as based on uh, John's walking experience that has covered the last two decades. So I'd like to take this time to formally welcome our guest tonight, Dr. John Francis. Um, John, welcome back to Madison. Okay, you're going to need to un unmute your, uh, your line. I need to learn how to do this. Thanks very <laughs> much, James. And uh, I've been zooming all over the place, but I'm happy to zoom back to Madison. Yeah. Awesome. Well, welcome, welcome. Um, you'll always have a place here. Um, and I also see several of our Nelson Institute colleagues in the audience. Um, and just so you all know, tonight's uh, program will be recorded. And um, please, in the chat, use the question and answer function as well as um, the uh, chat screen below to share your questions with John and also to engage 
your fellow audience members in the discussion. Now, um, John, I want to start all the way back at the beginning. And can you take us back to 1971 and tell us a little bit about the incident that happened that caused you to begin your career in environmental studies? Yeah, um, uh, it's a very good question because I have to revisit that, you know, or I don't get a chance to revisit it. As, as much as I would like, because I just find myself walking or I find myself in another part of my, my life. But I to, uh, was living in Northern California and in January, I saw uh, an oil spill. Uh, it was the first oil spill that I had seen. And um, it was really, I guess, the first major environmental impact. You know, I heard about pollution and I, heard about, uh, you know, people cutting trees down and losing uh, habitat, but I never really experienced it for myself, except that was the first time. And uh, it made me want to do something. Uh, and uh, what it made me want to do was like, I, and I told my girlfriend at the time, I said, I, I think we should stop riding and driving in cars. And she laughed at me and said, you know, um, uh, and let me take this out of my ear. I realized I have another hearing aid in there. Uh, um, and she, she kind of laughed at me and, and said, you know, we don't have enough money to do that. And I, I believe I, that, well, that was probably true. She said, if, if people just saw us walking around, um, they would just think we were a couple of bums and they, you know, and I and I, I accepted that. I thought that you had to have money in order to be considered uh, a real person. I mean that what you were going to do, what you felt, how you approach things um, had meaning. Is is that you had you had to have money for that? Uh, so I I waited. I waited until um, a friend's death convinced me. That uh, that I should act now and not wait for the money because he was he was about 27 years old, about the, the, my age. He was a deputy sheriff, and we were kind of on opposite sides of the fence. But we lived in this little village in in uh, Point Reyes, and he was the the sheriff. and And sure, he was looking in your garden to see what was growing and. And uh, he was always after my girlfriend because she liked to have a crop of uh, whatever that stuff is now that we can legally, <laughs> we can legally grow in California. And here in New Jersey, we get to, you know, legalize it. And um, I'll talk about that later, you know, uh, but I did inhale, but so some presidents didn't inhale and uh, they just kind of puffed on it. Um, and. And so anyway, I, I decided that, you know, Jerry Tanner, he passed away uh, in a boating accident and his death convinced me that we, we don't know and when our time is up, you know? <laughs> it's like, um, it might be tomorrow. It might be a year from now, who knows? But um, I wanted to walk. And so I decided I went walking to celebrate Jerry's life and, and literally, I just never came back from that walk because I, um, I realized that we only have this moment right now to do the things that we feel we must do. And so that was the choice I made back in 1971. Well, it's actually 72 because I had waited. <laughs> sure. You know, and and again, I'm I'm sorry for you, the loss of your friend, and I I can only imagine how that equally traumatic experience could have informed your decision. Now, tell me about your decision to stop talking. Now, walking is one thing, and, and I think that a lot of people can really um, understand the connection between uh, you know oil spills and the um, the industrial complex that it, that contributes to the environmental catastrophe that you witnessed. But what was the point in not talking for so long as well? Yeah, and, and that happened on my birthday, which was in 1973, I turned 27. 
And um, it was basically, I had been arguing all, all this time about whether walking could make a difference. And so um, I, got, I got tired of arguing um, because, well, I didn't really know if walking would make a difference. And so I found myself espousing something that I really had no idea <laughs> was, was this really something that was gonna work or not. And um, there were some, some other things which allowed me to keep not speaking, but the, the first day that I, on my birthday, I decided I wasn't gonna speak for one day. And uh, maybe if I had known I was gonna not speak for 17 years, I, I wouldn't have taken that first day of not speaking. But what I learned during that first day is that I, I hadn't really been listening to anyone, that I thought I knew everything. I thought I knew everything. And so um, I know none of you are guilty of this, but I would just wait until I, someone was finished saying what they were saying. I had already stopped listening to them. And uh, because I had stopped listening to them, of course, that ended communication. And I was thinking about what I was going to say back to them based on what I thought they were going to say. And not always were they going to say what I thought they were going to say. And this one day where, where I really had to just hold my tongue and listen, uh, I realized that um, I had missed all these opportunities to learn because <laughs> people had so much to say. And sometimes they said things completely different than I thought. And I said, well, this is really something I'm going to do it for another day and see what else I can learn. And the, the other thing I learned was that um, when I didn't speak, it was difficult for me to argue. You know, I couldn't argue. I, I just listened. And the other thing I learned is that, that I couldn't lie. Now, that that seems like, oh, John, you didn't lie. And I have to say, yes, I did. I, I was not very truthful in as, as a young man. And I would make things up, stories. If someone asked me, you know, uh, John, I see you're playing, you play the banjo. Or you, and I would go, yeah. And I, I have a, a, a record recording contract coming up with Columbia. You know, I mean, I don't know. I think as an African-American growing up in the 50s, I kind of understood, and it took a while, that um, I felt I needed something to make me better than what I was as a, as a human being. And so I would try to make up stuff. You know, I tried to make up stuff. And so when I stopped speaking, I couldn't do that. And it was like, oh my God, <laughs> who are you? Because that was the other thing, because after so many years of pretending to be someone else and trying to fit in to what I thought was the, the, the best thing, white America, I didn't know who I was. I had lost my own identity through all the stories that I had been telling myself, I started believing them. And so um, that made me want to not speak uh, another week and another month. And eventually I decided that, you know, this was so good for me that I didn't want to speak. I wasn't going to speak for a year. And then on my birthday, I would come back and I would ask myself, does this still work for me? Is it still appropriate? And, uh, and I would either end my silence or I would take another year vow. And so um, I didn't speak for 17 years. <laughs> and, and, and that's pretty much why, you know, I didn't understand all the other things that come from being silent. Uh, 
um, listening to nature, hearing nature, hearing yourself, and and actually um, living in a, an alternative reality, what do you call it? altered uh, uh, altered reality? Because reality became altered. Um, all the things I used to do, I didn't do. I didn't zip around any longer. I didn't, you know, make up stories. I I, I just played the banjo. And, and I painted and I played the banjo. Someone says, let me hear you play that banjo. And I would play the banjo. I, I have it with me, so I'll play something. But they, they say, God, that's really bad, John. <laughs> but that's, well, <laughs> that's how it sounded. <laughs> I mean, it would sound like it was. And like, I, I couldn't fake, I couldn't say, oh no, I really play really very well. No, it's just, just what you see is what you get. That was it, what you hear is, what it is so i'm i have to assume like everyone else in the audience i've got a lot of questions mainly because you know i'm trying to put myself in your head in 1973 at this point you know trying to figure out what it would take for me personally to have the self-awareness to take that vow and then to keep it going for that much time um, I think, you know, really what my first basic question is, um, you know, how did you communicate? You know, so you, you were still living in, and working in the, in the general world. In fact, you walked from California to Oregon to go to college, you know, and you got an undergraduate degree. How does it, an, undergraduate, an, an undergraduate earn a, a bachelor's degree without talking? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it, was, it was a lot of fun, I should say, but it was hard uh, because there were, I, I had to convince my professors that I wasn't just doing this as a joke or to get out of work. Um, uh, for me, there were, the instigation that, that I was learning all the time in just in the world, just by being in the world uh, and being in wilderness areas. Because I didn't exactly walk up to Oregon to go to university at first. I, I walked up to Oregon uh, to find wilderness. That was the first thing I was looking for. And, and I didn't know what wilderness was and so I had a map and it was, I think it was one of those triple A maps because we didn't have GIS back then. And um, I looked for green spots on the map. <laughs> and it was a green spot in uh, Southwestern Oregon. And it was called the Calmeopsis Wilderness. I had no idea what that meant, but that's where I was gonna walk. It was 500 miles. To get to, to get to Oregon from where I was and, uh, and go through the Calmeopsis. And the first time I walked up, it wasn't, uh, I didn't get to go in the Calmeopsis, but I did walk through the Siskiyou Mountains. And I have to say that being in nature um, was really healing for me. Um, being with old trees, <laughs> you know, being able to walk up Highway 101 in Northern California and find a redwood tree that was hollowed out, and in a rainstorm, being able to, to sleep in that tree. And, and to do that several times so that I would look for that tree, like year after year, to, to find that tree so I could sleep inside the heart of a redwood. <laughs> I, it was, that's what healed me. So I think it, it wasn't my, someone said, John, that you were just really very smart. You knew, I, like, I, I don't think so. I think my education came from just being in, in nature and, and looking to, uh, to find out discover what that was all about. And do you think that your experience helped you to, to 
find out more, not only about yourself, but also about the natural world? I mean, what did nature ultimately reveal to you? I mean, is, is, is there anything in particular that you were made to become aware of or understand based on that experience of walking and not talking? Yeah, ultimately, um, after, you know, uh, crossing the United States and, and studying environment formally, that was a big uh, shock to me that you could study environment um, and that people had written books about it <laughs> and, and that there were a whole bunch of other people who were thinking about environment as well. You know, um, after getting across the United States, uh, not speaking and going to school and working and going to school and working and getting all the way to the other side back here, actually to, to Cape May, New Jersey. And I live in a place called um, West Cape May, and I started in a place called in Marin County in, in California called West Marin. So very similar in that. Uh, my experience of environment included lots and lots of people. <laughs> you can imagine, <laughs> of, you know, thousands of people, you know, across the country would wave, I'd wave at people, people would pull up alongside me, they, you know, say, well, what are you doing? And, you know, and I go, and where do you come from? And I go, back that way. And I had the little slip of paper that I had a, a little track like that said, you know, that I was walking around the world um, as part of my education in the spirit and hope that I could be a benefit to to humankind, but I didn't know what that meant, <laughs> and this was part of that education, and so I stayed with lots of people. I played music with lots of people. I ate with lots of people. I worked with lots of different people, and people that would make my parents a little frightened if they saw me knocking on their door because they. You know, I would knock on someone's door who I'd seen on the road or met me on the road and they might have sounded different. They might have said to me, well, um, boy, can you play that banjo? Because I was carrying the banjo. And so someone to say that, you know, in another setting, I might have sent bristles up my, you know, <laughs> but in this setting that, that I was in, what all I could do was play the banjo. <laughs> and he would say, well, damn, you sure know how to play that banjo. Do you need a place to stay tonight? And my mother and my father, I'm sure they would be like the monster movie, you know, the monster movie where the person is going down in the basement and you're going, don't go down in the basement. That's where the monster is, right? I'd be knocking on the door and I could see my parents going, don't knock on that door. Those are the monsters. And they'd open a door and I would stand there with my eyes bugged open and my mouth open. And they'd look at me and they'd say, oh, uh, John, you ain't never seen so many guns on the wall, have you? <laughs> and you know, it would be like something that I had never seen before. And they said, oh, come on in, come on. We're gonna have dinner soon. And I was like going, maybe I did get to the wrong place, right? And I'm playing the banjo and this guy's on the phone calling. I said, oh, he's calling the buddies now. He's calling them, I could tell. And he says, you know that boy we seen walking on the road? I play the banjo. Yep, that's right, he's here. No, he can't come to your house for dinner. He's staying at our house for dinner. No, nope. Billy Bob is taking him to school tomorrow for show and tell. And that's the kind of experience I, I'd like to say that one, but it's one that's been used that that happened frequently. <laughs> you know, much like that, walking across the country. By the time I had gotten across the country, studied it, I had gotten my work at the University of Wisconsin. Oh my God. Here I am studying for a PhD. I don't talk. <laughs> what, 
what, what an amazing experience. And I'm sure, you know, not everybody thought I was, uh, you know, a good person to get a fellowship or, or be there at the university because I didn't talk, but some people did. And those people, and this one person I remember my major professor said to me, he said, John, you're gonna have to, uh, you're gonna have to get this PhD. You know, we're gonna help you. It's gonna be hard work, but we're gonna help you. And I'm gonna help you. It was John Steinhardt, which is my major professor. And, and uh, he passed away, but God bless him. He said to me, he says, John, without these three letters after your name, the people who need to hear what you have to say won't listen to you. And I just couldn't believe that. <laughs> he said, no, it's true. He says, and even with those three letters, they still might not listen. <laughs> because what you have to say is we know that your message isn't going to change. You're going to see the same message. You're going to get these three letters and you're not going to change your message. And the message that I had, which I discovered walking across the country and studying in the in, in, in university formal and informal education, it was about the environment. I, when I started out, I thought the environment was just about pollution and human-made ugliness and loss of species and habitat. You know, I started walking and my dissertation was on oil spills. I was writing on oil spills. But what I discovered is that environment it's also about people because if people are part of the environment and you know it's like I didn't see this I, I that if people are part of the environment then how we treat each other is our first opportunity to treat the environment in a sustainable way or even begin to understand what we mean by sustainability so environment for me became about human rights and civil rights and gender equality and economic equity and all the ways that we relate to each other because how we relate to one another, how we treat each other is gonna manifest in the physical environment around us because we're it. So if we oppress each other, if we exploit each other, what do you think we're gonna have? So that's what, <laughs> that's, that's what I learned from the environment. That's what I learned from walking into the trees and walking through the mountains and, you know, breathing the air and going down into the cities and getting to the one side of the country from the other side of the country. And that the one way that we need to treat each other if we say, well, how are we gonna treat each other? And I have this sign and I'm gonna show it is because this is a good one. That's a practice kindness. Can, that, can you get that? Practice kindness. That's what it is, practice kindness. And, and that's what we need to do all the time. <laughs> all the time from uh, all the people that we're around, whatever somebody's in front of you, that's what you wanna do. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to agree with everything that they say or that you can't disagree and verbally disagree, but we can all be kind to each other. We can all be kind to each other. So uh, anyway, well, <laughs> I, I mean, really I, got again, carried away. No, no, it's okay. I mean, I, boy, for someone who didn't talk for so long, you're never at a loss for words, which is fabulous in and of itself. But I really, what I'm, I'm like, I think per, profoundly curious about is now you've done this for a while now, and apparently nothing has changed with regard to your philosophy. With the, those three letters behind your name, you've got a PhD, people are listening to you. Um, do you think people are hearing? Are they, is, is this message resonating? Because, you know, we live in a world where there's a lot of unkindness, you know, and we're experiencing a lot of, of you know, very much ill intent of people who never, haven't learned that lesson. 
how can we instill that that same sense of practicing kindness today? Yeah, um, well, does does it resonate? I think um, it does resonate, but it's not a, you know, it's not like a, a, a policy. I mean, it could be a policy, and it's not like something that. Um, gosh, we have to have a, a million dollars to get this story out, <laughs> to be kind to each other. Or we need a, like a lot of money to get this. Story. Well, someone says, John, we're going to make a movie out of you and it's going to, you know, your story. And that's a lot of people are going to hear that. And I go, well, that's really great. But really the most important thing is the person in front of you. <laughs> the person that you're next to, your family, your, the, the people in your community. Because if it if it isn't resonating that way, if we're not doing it, you know, then it's not going to work. I mean, it's not it's not a story like we say. Well, yeah, practice kindness, and then we go right back to doing. <laughs> it's like continue to do what we do. Continue to work for the environment in the way that we work. You want to save the trees. You want to save you know, the water, clean water, all those things. But you also want to be kind and you want to be kind to each other because that's going to mean something. That's going to resonate. If, if it's just us here right now, it's going to resonate with the people that you come in contact with. It's got to, it's got to, that's how it works because we're all connected. And when I, when I say that, it's like, you know, we're, well, we're all connected and we're all brothers and sisters. And uh, oh yeah, no, that's really nice, John. No, but no, really, <laughs> we are really all related. <laughs> we are all related. And, it, and it's like, oh, I know it seems distant, but as you go, when you, if you go take a, I think it was Carl Stegen who, who turned out one of the satellites or spacecraft turned it back and looked at the planet because they said, well, what, what should we do? We have enough energy to, to take one last picture. Uh, and he said, well, let's take it where, where we come from. And it was just this little blue dot, just a little blue dot in space. And he's, he wrote a poem about that's where all our triumphs, all our agonies, all our everything comes, that little blue dot. And, and who do you think lives there <laughs> on that little blue dot, that little infinitesimal blue dot? How can we be anything else but who we are? <laughs> How can we be anything else but one people? We can. <laughs> wow. So now recently, and, and you and I have talked a couple of times in the last couple of years, you actually ran, uh, was it for Congress um, or, or was it for state Senate um, in New Jersey? I, I ran for Congress. Okay. Yeah. You know, and how did that go? You know, and I, I, I know that you didn't get elected, <laughs> but I'm curious, what, what, <laughs> What, what was <laughs> yeah. the, what, what was your platform? Yeah. What was the, I mean, because, I mean, this right. is one of those things where I, I really wish that everyone who could have voted for you had read your book and you'd probably be in Congress right now. I'm assuming that they, that they didn't. I, and I'm, I'm curious to, you know, to know how did that, that whole process of running for public office go and, and, and what did you think about it? Well, I mean, I had a, um, it's just a fantastic time. It was a fantastic experience for me. And um, there, of all the candidates, you know, I think I probably had the least amount of money. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and I was also running against, and I, and I would never say against, I wasn't running against anyone. I was running for everyone. <laughs> and, and that was my, what I would say, you know, they said, well, are you running against, I said, no, no, I'm not running against Amy. I'm running for everybody. And, um, but Amy Kennedy, you know, which of uh, Patrick uh, Kennedy's wife, just a wonderful person. I just loved her so much. And, 
And we just had such a great time on the campaign trail that afterwards, you know, when she won the nomination, she said to me, she said, John, if more people had known your story, you would be sitting here. And that was it. And that was a wonderful thing for her to say. And it's, it's very true, I would imagine. I mean, are you still involved politically? I mean, are you working um, with Amy or other political uh, leaders in your community to perhaps incorporate some of what you're advocating for on the, on the public stage? Yeah, well, you know, I, you know um, I am involved in making documentaries. Um, I do uh, still sit uh, as a commissioner on our borough's uh, uh, board of commissioners. And it's just, we, we have the um, Walsh system of government here. So we have three commissioners. And uh, once we're elected, we decide who's going to be the mayor and who's going to be the deputy mayor and who will just be the commissioner. So I'm I'm like the, the commissioner in charge of, uh, of, of the police and the fire department and public events. But just recently, our, uh, we had to vote on whether we could have marijuana cannabis in our, our borough for, we live in a, in a very agricultural area, West Cape May. So we have uh, farms and uh, we don't have the beach it's Cape May, the city has the beach. And, um, and so, yeah, we voted to have it. And I think only one other municipality voted to, to be able to grow and, and sell and dispense and all those things where everyone else was really um, dead against it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, get, I do get to speak and my name does get in the papers a lot. <laughs> you know, every week he says that Commissioner Francis said something silly or made a joke or something. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if I, I don't have the, the uh, I don't have the, the newspaper, the actual newspaper, but uh, I do have, which I will see if, this will come across the the I was a you know the political cartoons that people have. Uh, here's here's the political cartoon that I'm in. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, that's you. It's yeah. That's, that's supposed to be me, huh? <laughs> and those are my two fellow commissioners. And here in in West Cape May, we have the lima bean festival. That's a big <laughs> thing here because. <laughs> And so the other commissioner, or maybe that's the attorney, is saying, you know, um, <laughs> I don't think uh, people are going to go for the lima beans. <laughs> yeah, I says, let's face it, people don't really like lima beans. <laughs> While we're looking at, you know, marijuana plant leaves. So it's a lot of fun as well. I, I'm not, I don't want to sound like this is all, all serious and you can't have humor because Without that, then, you know, what is it? Well, yeah, um, everyone, um, we have a, a few minutes left. We have 20, about 20 minutes left in the hour. If you have questions, we've got a, a few in the chat, but if you have questions, please um, share them in the chat and um, we will ask them. Um, John, you said that um, if, if I, mean, I wasn't going to ask you this, but you volunteered, um, would you be able to play um, a bit of your banjo for us? Ah, uh, yes. I will. <laughs> I think I saw. Um, I think I saw Kurt Miney there. Yeah, he's he's indeed in the audience. Yeah. Well, Kurt. So for those of you who don't know, you. Kurt is the um, biographer of Aldo Leopold, um, and a colleague here at the uh, Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, um, and you know, um, one of the many people who uh, make this a very interesting campus. Uh, but John, we'd, we'd love it if you'd play a little for us.
awesome. That was absolutely amazing. John, thank you so much. Um, we've got a couple of questions and I'd love it if uh, Lynn uh, Pearson would unmute her microphone and ask her question. Hi, John. I'm sorry I missed you when you were in Madison. Um, I am, I noticed in your book, you had, someone did a uh, kid's story for you so you could do a presentation with kids telling your story and it was kind mm -hmm. of a fantasy. Was wondering if that was ever published. Um, there, that was a, it's so good to see you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and that, <laughs> that story was about, up, I think it was in Port Townsend, Washington. And um, it was actually a dance and uh, a performance. And, okay. uh, and uh, I was involved with a lot of children walking across the country. So we did a dance of the oil spill. Oh, it was so much fun. <laughs> and the birds getting out of the you know, water and being cleaned. And um, it was just a, it wasn't, it was never published except it just in how I described it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I am writing I, a children's book right now. Oh, uh, good. And it's it's a um, it's a uh, illustrated book. I'm not doing the illustrations, um, uh, but it's an illustrated book on the history of kindness, the world history of kindness. The reason I ask is I'm putting together. Uh, a collection of books for my church's uh, library. Uh, and so I'm always looking for books that have themes and have uh, brown faces on yeah. them. Uh, and they're not as common as I wish they were, but I think your story, I look forward to seeing your story. And if you have any others that you might suggest, um, I'd love to hear what they are. Okay, you know, and I'll um, I'll let uh, uh, James know, and he can pass those on to you. Awesome, thank you, um, Kurt. It uh, looks like you un unmuted your microphone. You must have a question. <laughs> oh man! Well, thank you, James, and hi everybody. I see a lot of friends on the screen here in front of me and one of my old in fact the oldest friend of mine on the screen is John so hey buddy <laughs> um, I'll tell you what I was thinking about James and this is something I'll put out for all you Nelson Institute colleagues and friends John has many distinctions and stories and some of them I know and some of them I don't but there's a really important one that John I wonder if you could say a few words about John and I, after we finished our graduate work in Madison, we both, by pure coincidence, ended up in Washington, D.C., living close to each other um, in the early 90s. It's a long story, but I'm actually writing about this. And John, you're in my draft chapter on this. But in October 1991, 30 years ago, this fall, was one of the most important moments in the history of the environmental movement, and especially the history of the environmental justice movement. October in 1991 in Washington, D.C. was held the uh, first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit, the Environmental Justice Summit, sometimes it's called. John, you were there. Yes. And I wonder if you I could was. share with this audience, because especially I see a lot of younger faces here, um, just a few thoughts on 30th anniversary of this landmark event. And James, I'm really going to, let's talk on the side sometime about doing some programming around because it's a real opportunity to reflect, but also to share with our, our younger colleagues the important foundations and shoulders that we all stand on. And John, you were, boy, well, I'll just leave it at that, John. What comes to mind now 30 <laughs> years later when you think back on that moment? Yeah, yeah, I, I remember um, how I felt. And I'll tell you, I just felt like it for me it was like a homecoming because um i had missed all those uh uh black and brown faces uh 
as I walked across the country, who would understand, who could understand uh, the feelings that I had. Uh, I think a lot of the people like my parents, my parents didn't even understand, you know, um, and uh, with, and in my neighborhood, <laughs> my, 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 my friends had a hard time wrapping their head around uh, environment or why I even bothered. Uh, it wasn't most of most of the, the people in my family who were uh, involved in, in agriculture and in farm in farming in the South, they got it. They they understood it. And I think a lot of um, of uh, that leadership conference really took in consideration of, of uh, black people in the South. And uh, they were, I think, the backbone of what the environmental movement in uh, as far as people of color were concerned. Uh, and, I, and we had something that I think the environmental justice movement began and there was a uh, uh, actually a, not an agency, but an office of environmental justice that, that the White House had started. Um, and it was still it was still a difficult time, you know, and, and even now, you know, we still find ourselves um, struggling, you know, but as, as far as I'm concerned, the struggle is, uh, how do we say, I mean, it, it, it's like Black Lives Matter, that's a you know, and, and, and George Floyd, who had been had been murdered on, on the on the streets, it's like that's when I say how we treat each other is what's going to manifest in the environment. It's like that's where we are still. I mean, of, of course, I think our consciousness, and and it's all I can do is think about consciousness is like our consciousness is is beginning to rise or our consciousness is rising but boy you know <laughs> we just have this so 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 far and so we're we're all together on this you know and to where when somebody says all lives matter you know there's no like yeah, but it's when that happens, I, I want to jump up and down and celebrate with you in Washington, D.C. We'll stop at our favorite place, Kurt, and uh, it'll be uh, dinner and drinks on me. I don't drink right now, but... <laughs> For that time, <laughs> I think I will. You know, and I'm I'm really interested in in um, well, thank you, Kirk, for asking that question because you know, frankly, I was aware of that event, but I didn't realize that it was um, the 30th anniversary this year. And um, frankly, I think it's really worth talking about because you know, a lot of people are coming into the environmental movement, especially the environmental justice movement, as if it's a brand new thing, you know, and. We're now in our second or perhaps our third generation of this, and and you know something that we really haven't talked much about in the course of this conversation is the um, is is our issues of race, um, you know, with regard to your story. But I don't really think that race has that much to do specifically with your philosophy and your ethos, because it really is about how we treat one another, you know. And I and I'm very curious to know in the course of our conversations around things like the Black Lives Matter movement, how can we better incorporate what you've already shared, you know, for a modern ethos, you know, that is a, perhaps even more like the other Leopold land ethic where we're really talking about these, these issues as being able to maintain the integrity of the environment by having better relationships with other people. What, what are your thoughts on that, John? Well, I'm, you know, I, I agree with you. I ended my book on kindness. <laughs> the future of kindness depends on you, you know. <laughs> and um, 
it's like, it's, it's not me. I mean, yeah, it is me, but it's all of us. And, uh, and we all have to kind of step up and have the conversation or uh, do the, do the walk, you know, or do the work, you know, so it's just, it's just up to us to, to move that forward. Yeah, and it, frankly, I mean, when I stop and think about what exactly that means, you know, and, and, and it, frankly, it's, it's like, you know, wearing masks during a pandemic. You know, it's not about your health, it's about the health of the person standing next to you. You know, and I really wish that we could collectively decide that, you know, we need to take care of the, the natural environment, not necessarily just for ourselves, but for everyone around us. And, and again, I really wish that more people would take the time to read your book, to stop talking, do more walking, and in the process, hopefully do a, a lot more listening. And I can't tell you how grateful I am for the opportunity to um, listen to you tonight. So um, is there anything that you'd like to, to share as we close out the last five minutes of this conversation that um, you, you can close us out on? Well. I'm gonna I tell one story. Uh, it's uh, when I went to work at the Coast Guard because the Coast Guard hired me because uh, about um, to help write oil spill regulations after Exxon Valdez happened, and I was actually being published at, at the time um, in uh, all the oil spill publications because I had a database and I, that was what my, my dissertation was on. And of course, um, uh, it was in the news and, and I saw I was working at, at the Coast Guard headquarters. They were mandated to write the regulations and I was the environmental uh, analyst and uh, project director manager. And while I was there, a lot of the staff, we were, we were all having us talk and, and the staff was kind of patting themselves on the back for being able to change all these regulations. And, you know, we're writing these regulations and um, it made me, you know, I, I had to stop and I say, you know, we get to write these regulations because th that's where we are now. But these regulations would not be even thought of if it wasn't for the thousands and thousands of people across the country who are about making a difference in pollution, making a difference on, on the environmental issues. And so where at some point where we become a, the environmental leadership or whatever, it's, it's, it's great. We get to be there. You know, we get to you know, shake the hand, sign the dotted line, but it's everybody else. <laughs> We're only doing it for all the thousands and thousands and the millions of people who who are helping us to be where we are and, and asking us to do what we're doing. So um, I think that's where I'm gonna end. Well, um, John, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to visit with us tonight. And I'd also like to thank everyone in the audience for being with us. Um, I, I definitely need to thank uh, the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies for uh, providing the, the platform that we're using tonight. Um, also, again, thank you very much for the financial support of Saris Innovations and Outdoor Research. Um, and I hope that you'll look forward to our next discussion. The book that uh, we'll be talking about is Trace by Lorette Savoy. And I hope that you'll continue to follow along the Joy Chip Reading Project. Um, just find the uh, details for how to do that on our website at joychipproject.com. And please, for God's sake, keep reading. Um, I'm going to say good night. We'll close this out. And again, thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us. And um, we will see you next month. Take care. Have a great evening. Good night.